With God, all things are possible. I think all of us have heard that verse. Brother Rick just read that text. With God, all things are possible. Is that really true? Are all things possible? Can God take the impossible, something that isn't possible from a human standpoint, and make it happen? If you reflect back on some of the accounts that we've talked about over the years, if you've read any of the Bible, and you go back and you see how God made man from the dust of the ground, that's impossible for man. We can't do that. Man can't make one cell of life. Not one cell of life. Everything that man does in the lab is taking something that God has created and dealing with that. God can take nothing and make something. But for humanity, we have to have matter in order to make something. I don't say create because a creator takes nothing and creates. But man does not have that ability. Two weeks ago, I gave a sermon called Let Your Requests Be Made Known to God. And I made the comment that this could be a series. And a number of people said, would you do at least another sermon on that particular topic? So this is actually kind of spinning off of Let Your Requests Be Made, made Known to God. Because we talked about in, these, in, these, in that sermon, we had talked about some things that God did that were amazing. We looked at some Bible accounts. We just took a brief overview. We talked about the different ways you can pray, how to pray. We talked about confusion in prayers. How many times when pastors today pray, they don't pray correctly. They'll start off their prayer, Father in heaven, and then before you know it, instead of closing in Jesus' name, they'll say, in your name we pray. And we don't know if you're talking to the Father or the Son at that point. So we talked about those things. Well, in making your request known to God, it's always good to know how to talk to God. And that's what we addressed the other week. But this week, we're talking about with God, all things are possible. How far can we take that? How far does that go? Do you believe that God answers prayers? We just had prayer time right before this sermon. And there were a number of prayers that were praises, a number of things were praises because of answered prayers. So let's take a look at this text where this sermon title comes from. Brother Rick just read this a few moments ago. With God, all things are possible. I'm going to put it on the PowerPoint for you from the New King James, Matthew 19, 23 through 26. It says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard, when the disciples heard it, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said to them, With men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Now, you can find this account also in Mark chapter 10, 23 through 27, and Luke chapter 18, 24 through 27. It's interesting that they all are in about the same verse range, different chapters. Matthew is chapter 19, Mark is chapter 10, Luke is chapter 18, but they all fall in that same verse range. So if you're ever there and you want to look at the account in this particular place, you can find it in those other places within the same verses, which is pretty neat. Just remember the chapter. But... When they look at this, he says, again, look at that verse. It is hard for a rich man to enter in the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't say a rich man, it's impossible. It doesn't say that. It's hard. It says it's easier in the next verse for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And this has been explained by many scholars and people. A lot of them will like to say, well, the eye of a needle is actually talking about a door in Jerusalem that was very short and the camel would have to get down on its knees and go through that hole. They call it the needle's eye. But, you know, it's hard to find anything like that. If you do a little research, you can't find any archaeological evidence of such a thing. So where did that come from? It comes from critics, people who don't believe that all things are possible with God. That's where it comes from. If you look at this account and you, and you read it in the Greek, when it says it is easier for a 
it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, as it says there in verse 24. It is easy, and again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of, kingdom of God. That eye of the needle is actually speaking of a sewing needle. You can look it up. Is that impossible? It is for men. But is it impossible for God? Take a look at that picture. That kind of says it all, doesn't it? There on the PowerPoint, on the screen. <laughs> is that possible? We, we look at that, and that's, that's a great illustration. So what I thought we would do is I thought we would go ahead and we're going to look at an account, and you might say, well, what does this have to do with the eye of a needle? Well, it really doesn't, but it has to do with with God all things are possible. We're going to take a look at a Bible account, and it's actually, let's just go to Judges chapter 2, just to give us a little bit of a foundation for what we're going to speak of. I'm sure we've all heard of Gideon. We've all heard of this man, Gideon. And in Judges chapter 2, I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview here. Of It it's kind of lays a little foundation for us. And notice what it says. Let's just start in, I could, let's just start, let's just read this whole chapter just for context. Judges chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And the angel of Jehovah came up to Gilgal from Bochum and said, I led you up from Egypt and brought you to a land which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. So this is God speaking. He's never going to break his covenant. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars, but you shall not have obeyed but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Therefore, I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns in your side, and their, shall, and their God shall be a snare to you. So it was when the angel of Jehovah spoke these words to all the children of Israel that the people lifted up their voices and wept. And they called the name of the place Bochum and they sacrificed there to Jehovah. So this name, or this place that they named Bochum actually means to weep or weeping. That's the literal translation. That's why it says right before that, they lifted up their voices and wept. Verse 6 says, And when Joshua, and his, and when Joshua had dismissed the people, the children of Israel went each to his own inheritance to possess the land. And then we continue in verse 7. So the people served Jehovah all the days of Joshua and all the days the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of Jehovah which he had done for Israel. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Jehovah, died when he was 110 years old. Then they buried him within the border of, of the inheritance at Timnah, Haras, in the mountains of Ephraim on the north side of Mount Gaash. When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know Jehovah nor the work which he had done for Israel. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of Jehovah and served the Baals. And they forsook Jehovah, their, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were around them. And they bowed down to them, and they provoked Jehovah to anger. They forsook Jehovah and served Baal and the Ashtoreth. And anger of Jehovah was hot against Israel. So he delivered them into the hands of, the, of plunderers who despoiled them and sold them into the hands of their enemies all around so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. Wherever they went out, the hand of Jehovah was against them for calamity, as Jehovah had said, and as Jehovah had sworn to them as they were greatly distressed. Nevertheless, Jehovah raised up judges who delivered them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but they played the harlot with other gods and bowed to them and turned quickly from the way in which their fathers walked in obeying the commandments of Jehovah, they did not do so. So you, if you remember in, in the Old Testament when we read earlier last year, we read in, in the Exodus how the people were taken out of Egypt 
And then Jehovah taught them how to live. He taught them all of the things. He gave them his commandments. They agreed that they would do it. And what's happened is by the time we get to this account, they had been disobedient, and then they were brought back, and they were disobedient. It just over and over and over again, we see these things happen. So God gives them these judges. Well, as we look here, you notice in verse 13, it says, they forsook Jehovah and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. Well, this, this Ashtoreth is actually the same god Astarte. A lot of people may not know that. It's the same god Astarte. Who is Astarte? Astarte is a sex goddess. It's the goddess of fertility. It's the god that the people worship at Easter when they have rabbits. Astarte was actually pictured in, in ancient Greek in some of their uh, hallways and their monuments and in their tombs. They actually have pictures of Astarte, which is a woman holding the hand of a rabbit. Why? Because rabbits are fertile. And where do the <coughs> eggs come from? Well, that shows fertility again. So all of these things, God says, stay away from these things. And this time of year, what are people doing? They're running right toward it. They're running right toward it. They're not avoiding these things. And really, it's bringing filth into God's worship. That's what it's doing. So it says, they forsook Jehovah and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. Well, the account continues. Let's just finish out this chapter, and then we're going to jump to a part that's that to me is just, it's a very interesting account. Uh, where did I leave off? Let's start here in verse 18. It says, And when Jehovah raised up judges for them, Jehovah was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For Jehovah was moved with pity by their groaning because of those who oppressed them and harassed them. And it came to pass when the judge was dead that they reverted and behaved more corruptly than their fathers by following other gods to serve them and bow down to them. They did not cease from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. So it seems that whenever these people are left alone, they go right back to the ways that they had. You know, this is a good idea as to why we need to come together and study God's word because the world pounds on us constantly, all day, every day. And we need to get out of that environment and into an environment where we're reminded of these things and where it centers us on the one true God. And it says in verse 20, Then the, the anger of Jehovah was hot against Israel. And he said, Because this nation has transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and has not heeded my voice, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations which Joshua left when he died, so that through them I may test Israel whether they will keep the ways of Jehovah to walk in them as their fathers kept them or not. Therefore Jehovah left those nations without driving them out immediately, nor did he deliver them into the hand of Joshua. So I just I wanted to read this because it, it sets things up as to what they were doing, as to how they were they would be obedient for a time when the judges were there and then disobedient when they were left alone. It seems like God is always sending people to his people to bring them and point them back to him. And, you know, last week's sermon, Brother Rick gave a sermon about don't take my Lord away. And that's what the churches and people are doing today. They're taking Jesus from us. And we have to be reminded. We have to be reminded, too, that there's a balance Many churches replace Jesus with a false Jesus. Many Christians do that. They put Jesus in a position where he doesn't belong. But there's a balance that's involved. The son points us to the father. The father points us to the son. But ultimately, all worship, in turn, if we worship Jesus, it ultimately goes to the father. So let's turn now to Judges chapter 6. Let's take a look at this account. Judges chapter 6. And... Many of us are very familiar with this. I think, you know, if, if I would have realized it before I kind of set my eyes on doing this sermon, I think Brother Rick would do a much better job at preaching this sermon because I think this is one of your favorite accounts. I think this is one that you, you know very, very well. And, and I, I just, I've heard him talk about this years ago, but I haven't heard him say anything much recently. But I always love the way he explains these things. So beginning here in Judges chapter 6, 
Uh, we're just going to start in verse 1. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of Jehovah. So, so Jehovah delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because of the Midianites. The children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds which are in the mountains. So it was whenever Israel had sown, yeah, whenever Israel had sown, Midianites would come up, also Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. Then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents, coming as in as numerous as locusts, both they and their camels were without number, and they would enter land to destroy it. So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried out to Jehovah. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to Jehovah because of the Midianites that Jehovah sent a prophet to the children of Israel who said to them, Thus says Jehovah, God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt, and brought you out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. Also, I said to you, I am Jehovah your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. So here God sends him a prophet. He brings the Israelites up from the land of Egypt. That's what he says, with a mighty hand and a stretched out arm. And when in bondage, he had broken their yoke. And they were oppressed, and he set them free. And the multitudes of Moabites, Ammonites, Midianites, the Canaanites had oppressed their entrance into the into their entrance into the promised land. He actually brushed them all away and given their land to the Israelites. And then he gives them the simple command not to worship the idols of Canaan. Don't worship the idols. Don't get involved in idolatry. In other words, <clears throat> look around this world today. Let's, let's give this a modern-day application. God says, don't get involved in this, these pagan rituals, in the Baals and the Ashtoreths. And what do we do? We have Christian churches, and they're substituting at Halloween time, instead of trick or treat, they say, oh, well, that's okay. We'll just change the name to trunk or treat. That would be like me having a false god up here, a Baal up here, and saying, well, no, no, this is, this is not, not, it's not what it looks like. What are we doing? We're honoring the day. We're paying homage to the day. We shouldn't do that. Jehovah is the true God. They were asked to obey his voice. It applies today. Well, look at Gideon. Here, let's take a look at this account. This is where it really gets good. I love this. So we start here with Gideon. By the way, the, the, the name Gideon means hewer, H-E-W-E-R. In other words, to cut or to chop. Or have you ever cut a tree down and then you, you take the limbs off? They call that felling the tree. They fell the tree. So the, the word Gideon can also mean feller, which is cutting the limbs off of a tree. So not like he's a good feller, not like that. But I guess if he cuts the limbs off a tree, well, he is a good feller, right? So verse 11, it says, And the angel of Jehovah came and sat under the terebinth, I think the King James says oak tree, which was in Afra, and belonged to Joash, the uh, Abiazrite, and the son of Gideon, threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of Jehovah appeared to him and said to him, Jehovah is with you, you mighty men of valor. Gideon said to him, O oh my Lord, if Jehovah is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not Jehovah bring us up from, the land, up from Egypt? But now Jehovah has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Wow, you know, I hear people say that today. What's it say here? Where are all his miracles? I hear people saying that today. Pay attention. Pay attention to what's going on around you. Take your focus off of worldly things and focus on the things that God is doing in your life. 
and in the lives of others. We've witnessed a number of those miracles in the past month with people we've been praying for. It says, verse 14, But Jehovah turned to him and said, Go in this night, Go in this might of yours, and you will give Israel from the hand of the Midianites. You will save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So he said to him, O oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And Jehovah said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Then he said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who talk with me. Do not depart from here. I, what? I pray until I come to you and bring, you out, bring out my offering and set it before you. And he said, I will wait until you come back. So I want you to notice that there is prayer involved here. There's prayer involved. Verse 19, so Gideon went in and prepared a young goat and unleavened bread from an ephah of flour. The meat he put in a basket, and he put the broth in a pot, and he brought them out to him under the terebinth tree and presented them. And the angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread and lay them on the rock and pour out the broth, and he did so. And the angel of Jehovah put out the end of the staff and it was, that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread and fire rose out of the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread and the angel of Jehovah departed out of his sight. Now Gideon perceived that he was the angel of Jehovah. So Gideon said, Alas, O Lord Jehovah, for I have seen the angel of Jehovah face to face. Then Jehovah said to him, Peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. So Gideon built an altar there to Jehovah and called it Jehovah is Peace. To this day, it is still in Afra of the Abiezrites. Verse 25. Now it came to pass the same night that Jehovah said to him, Take your father's young bull and the second bull of seven years old and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has cut down that your father has, and cut down the wooden image that is beside it. And build an altar to Jehovah your God on top of this rock in the proper arrangement. And take the second bull and offer burnt sacrifice of the wood and of the image which you shall cut down. Verse 27. So Gideon took ten men from among the servants and did as Jehovah said to him. But because he feared his father's household and the men of the city too much to do it by day, he did it by night. Maybe there was a little lack of faith there, huh? A little scared about the daytime. And then verse 28, And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, there was the altar of Baal torn down, and the wooden image that was beside it was cut down. The second bull was being offered on the altar which had been built. So they said to one another, Who has done this thing? And when they had inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. Then the men of the city said to Joash, Bring out your son that he may die, because he has torn down the altar of Baal, and because he has cut down the wooden image that was beside it. Think about what's happening here. What's taking place? Bring, the, bring out your son that he may die, because he tore down this false god altar? That's happening today. People are being ousted and not accepted by ministries and churches because they're standing up for the true God, because they're standing up for the truth of the Bible. Verse 31, But Joash said to all who stood against him, Would you plead for Baal? Would you save him? Let the one who would plead for him be put to death by morning. If he is a god, let him plead for himself because his altar has been torn down. So think about this. The true God can defend himself. These false gods can't. 
The true God can defend himself. So when I look at this, would you plead for Baal? Isn't that what's happening when people say, well, that's not why I'm doing this or that. That's not why I'm celebrating this holiday. They're, they're making an excuse. They're pleading for Baal. They're pleading for a false god. I know it stings when I say that. We can justify it all we want. Remember when, when Aaron made that golden altar? It was a golden altar to Jehovah. It was an altar to him. But it was unacceptable. God didn't accept it. That's not what he wanted. Verse 32. Therefore, on the day that he called him, on that day he called him Jerubbabel, saying, Let Baal plead against him because he has torn down his altar. Then all the Midianites and all the Amalekites and the people of the east gathered together, and they crossed over and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of Jehovah came upon Gideon, and he blew, then he blew the trumpet, and the Ab Abiazrites gathered behind him. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, who also gathered behind him. He also sent mess messengers to Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali, and they came up to meet him. So Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, look, I shall put out a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is a dew on the fleece only, and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. And it was so. When he rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece together, he wrung the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, Do not be angry with me, but let me speak just once more. Let me test, I pray, just once more with the fleece. Let it now be dry on the fleece, but on all the ground let there be dew. And God did so that night. It was dry on the fleece only, but there was dew on all the ground. So what's happening here? Gideon puts this fleece on the ground. It says there in verse 37, notice, if there's dew on the fleece only and the ground is dry, then I'll know that, that you're paying attention, that this is, this is good, that you're listening. Well, have you ever said a prayer and you thought, well, I think this is from God, but I'm not sure. <laughs> I said that prayer this morning. <laughs> so what happens? What do you do at that point? Well, he wasn't afraid to go back to God and say, I'll tell you what, let's do the opposite now. This time I'm going to put the fleece down. What's it say? In verse 39, let me test. I pray once more and the fleece, let it now be dry only on the fleece and let the ground have dew. Have you ever laid a blanket out in dewy grass and ever picked it up and it was dry? That's never happened to me. It's always wet with dew. So, it's funny to me when he prayed this first prayer, he's probably thinking, well, let's see, it could have been wet. Maybe that was just by chance that that happened. So he prayed the opposite, and it happened. This was an answer to a prayer. If you ever have something and you feel like you need to pray about it, and, you, and you're not sure if this is an answer from God, test him, ask him, show me, help me to know that this is what I need to do. One of the prayers that I've prayed in, in witnessing to my wife, I've often prayed that God will make it abundantly clear to me when I'm supposed to open my mouth and speak. And since I've prayed that prayer, I don't think I've said more than a few sentences about God's word. I guess the timing isn't right. And I trust that he's going to move me to speak, just like he did with this fleece. Well, what happened as a result of this fleece? Let's just read chapter 7. Let's read the rest of this account. It says, Then Jerubbabel, chapter 7, verse 1, Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, remember his name was changed, then Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the well of Herod. So the camp of so that the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them by the, by the hill of Morah in the valley. And Jehovah said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many. So look at that again. 
The people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into your hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. So God didn't want any mistake. He didn't want them to think, oh, wait a minute, we won that war. We won that battle. He wants them to know that this is from him. This is of a divine hand. So look at what happens next. You have too many people with you, and I don't want their heads getting puffed up. So verse 3, Now therefore proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gideon, Gilead. And 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. But Jehovah said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. Then, then it will be that, that of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, the same shall go with you, and of whomever I say to you, this one shall not go with you, the same shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and Jehovah said to Gideon, everyone who laps, from the, laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps shall be set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouth, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people got down on their knees to drink water. So think about this. He takes all of these people down there. And, you know, you think about it. You're thirsty. When you're thirsty, you want to get down to that water and you want to suck it up into your mouth as fast as you can. But he's saying, no, those ones who pick it up like this and lap it like a dog. You know, I don't know, the account doesn't tell us, but to drink like that, I, I do know this, to drink like you're lapping like a dog, it takes self-control, especially if you're thirsty. These men had to trust God. Did God put it in their heart to do that? It seems he did. The account doesn't say it right out, but God had a, something in mind. Verse 7, then Jehovah said to Gideon, by the 300 men who lapped, I will save you. So they went from thousands of men down to 300 to fight this battle. That's impossible with men. So it says, by the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, every man to his place. Can you imagine the faith that takes? I couldn't imagine being in that position. Having to let all of your troops, all of your people go, and just a few hundred people, and you're going to defeat this large army? So, verse 8. So the people took provisions and their trumpets in their hands, and he sent away all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, and retained those 300 men. Now the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. It happened to be on the same night that Jehovah said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have delivered it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with, with Pura, your servant, and you shall hear what they say. And afterward, your hand shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down with Pura, his servant, to the outposts of, the arm, uh, to the outposts of armed men who were in the camp. Now the Midianites and the Malachites and the people of the east were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts, and their camels were without number and the sand by the, as the sand by the seashore in multitude. So imagine the scene. You've got thousands and thousands and thousands of people. When Gideon, verse 13, and when Gideon had come, there was a man telling a dream to his companion. He said, I have had a dream. To my surprise, a loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian. It came to a tent and struck it so that it fell and overturned, and on that tent, and the tent collapsed. Then his companion answered and said, this is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. Into his hand, God has delivered Midian and the whole camp. 
And so it was when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation that he worshipped. He turned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for Jehovah has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. Then he divided the 300 men into three companies and he put a trumpet into every man's hand with empty pitchers and torches inside the pitchers. And he said to them, Look, look at me and do likewise. Watch, and when I come to the edge of the camp, you shall do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then you blow the trumpets on every side of the whole camp and say, the sword of Jehovah and of Gideon. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outpost of the camp and beginning at the middle watch, just as they posted the watch, they blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers that were in their hands. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers. And they held the, t the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands for blowing. And they cried, The sword of Jehovah and Gideon. And every man stood in the place all around the camp. And the whole army ran and cried out and fled. When the 300 blew the trumpets, Jehovah set every man's sword against his companion throughout the whole camp. And the army fled to Beth Acacia toward Zira, Zerira, as far as the border of the Abel, Mehola, and Tabith. And the men of Israel gathered together from Naphtali, Asher, and Manasseh and pursued the Midianites. Then Gideon sent messengers throughout all the mountains of Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and seize from them watering places as far as Beth Bera and the Jordan that all the men of Ephraim gathered together and seized the watering places as for Beth Bera and the Jordan. And he captured two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb. They killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb, and Zeb they killed at the winepress of Zeb. They pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of the Jordan. It's kind of graphic. It's kind of graphic. But when we look at this, we look at what happens. Gideon subdues the Midianites. In, in verse 10 of chapter 8, if you just look at that very, very briefly, verse 10 of chapter 8, it says, Now Zeba and Zalmunna were at Karkor and their armies with them, about 15,000, all who were left of the army of the people of the east, and 120,000 men who drew the sword had fallen. So what happened? It says 120,000 people by just 300 without ever lifting, without ever them having to kill anyone. That's impossible. 300 defeating 120,000? 300 going into battle without being in battle? You see, with God, it's not impossible. We read these accounts. Do we believe them? Do we believe that God still works today like he did then? Or are we saying what they said here in Judges 6, verse 13? Oh, my Lord, if Jehovah is with us, why has, has this happened to us? Bad things happen to everybody. It says, and where are all his mercies which our fathers told us about? Or all his miracles, I'm sorry, all his miracles which our fathers told us about. People are saying that today. They're saying this can't possibly happen. I want you to notice that there is a trumpet blast. There's a trumpet coming in our future. There's a trumpet coming in our future. And when you hear that, what's going to happen? The dead in Christ shall rise. That's a miracle. We're still living in Bible times. You know, we say it all the time. We think about these things. We think about what, what uh, people say. They say, well, in the Bible times, it was this way or that way. Or they, they think certain things. But I want you to think about, are we living in Bible times or not? What are we doing? Sorry, my phone buzzed, and I'm trying to make it stop. I hope you didn't hear that. So, by man's thinking... 
These odds were impossible. But God turned them on each other. God turned them on each other. With God, all things are possible. Is there anything in your life that keeps you from a relationship with God? If it is, pray about it. If you want a relationship with God, pray about it. Gideon prayed. He put out a fleece. You can put out a fleece. If there's something in your life that you're not sure if this is God telling you to do one thing or another, put out a fleece, so to speak. It doesn't have to be actually putting out a fleece. It's a, it's a figure of speech. Pray about everything in your life. You can pray about, as we said two weeks ago, you can pray at any position, in any posture, whether you're laying down, standing up, kneeling, walking, driving, eyes open, eyes shut, hands clasped, hands open, hands up. It doesn't matter. Whatever is appropriate for the occasion. If you lack faith, you can pray about it. If you have a problem overcoming something, you can pray about it. If you want a better attitude, I know I need that sometimes, particularly when I'm driving or sometimes if I'm in a store waiting in line in a supermarket. I need a better attitude. I'm pretty impatient sometimes. If you want to have the fruitage of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faith, mildness, self-control, pray about it. Pray about it. If you want to learn how to memorize more Bible texts, make it a matter of prayer. God will work those things. If you want a better job with better hours, if you want the Sabbath off, anything, you can pray about these things. Some of the things that I've prayed about in my life was to be able to be able to teach people what God's Word says, to be able to do public speaking, to be able to evangelize. I wanted to be able to do that. I was so afraid, and I prayed about it. And it's almost as if instantaneously God took that fear from me. If you want to do ministry, but you're afraid, maybe you're a little timid or a little shy, pray about it. You know, I've, I've, when I first met Brother Ed, he was so quiet. And I never would imagine that he would teach. But he's, he teaches and he preaches. We've gone out when we have the... Uh, Bible series and handed out flyers. That really took him out of his comfort zone. But I know he was praying about it. And he did it. He did it. Some of you might have to make adjustments in your life to where you have to leave your church family because there are things that they're teaching that aren't quite right. And you might feel like, well, I can be a witness there. Pray about that, that you can be a witness there, that you can keep that witness going. But if you feel that you have to make that cut, Pray about it. Pray that the timing will be right. But pray that you can have a ministry wherever you are. Be patient about it. Whatever it is, you can pray about these things. Gideon prayed. He tested God. You can test him with your prayer. Many of you have heard me say this many times. I know you have. When it came down to uh, keeping the Sabbath, I knew I was going to have to close my business. And I knew it was going to be a very profitable time that I was closing. And I was, I was scared. And I prayed about it. And God made a way. When I had to leave the church that I was a part of, when the time came and I knew it was time to go, I, thought I, was, I knew I was going to lose everybody that I had. But it's amazing that God showed me in the middle of the night a Bible text in Mark chapter 10. It says, if you're, if you're not willing to leave father or mother or brother or sister or homes or lands for my sake and the gospels, then you're not worthy of me. Jesus said that. I prayed about it. And I told God, I can't do it. Gideon couldn't do it. He had to have God on his side. We need the Father and his Son on our side. Pray about these things. You know, when I, when I look at this when I look at that picture that we had there of the eye of the needle and the camel going through it, when I think about those things and I see that, it's, it's impossible. And people laugh. The camel isn't going through the eye of that needle. 
I really believe God can do that. I really do. I hope you do too. The more you read the Bible and the more you see these accounts, critics try to say that the Red Sea wasn't parted. But it was. They say that the the horses could actually walk through. Well, then how did they drown? (laughs) How did they drown if they could walk through? What happened to them? You see, there's always, there's always an answer to the critics' questions, and it's always going to come from God's Word, the Bible. So whatever it is in your life, if you have a vice, if there's something, whether it's drinking or smoking or overeating or wandering eyes or maybe uh, things on the Internet you shouldn't be watching or YouTube channels or holidays maybe that you, you realize that there's something there that you need to give up, pray about it. God will help you through those times. And pray that he helps you do it in the right way so that you can witness to others in doing it. Because sometimes if I go on my own, well, every time when I go on my own, I seem to be very offensive and abrasive and push people away. And I look back on my life and I say, wow, I wish I would have listened to God. And sometimes God puts people in your life to tell you certain things. And I'll never forget, I'm going to tell on myself, we were at a, uh, we were in like a meeting hall where there was a meal, and I was, I was really fed up with the false doctrines of those around me, and this was quite a few years ago, and I made a remark that was true, but it was very pointed, and Mary was in front of me, and she turned around and gave me the stink eye, <laughs> like I shouldn't be saying that. And she told me, she said, you really need to be careful what you say. And she was right. Now, if she hadn't been there and somebody else had been there, I could have easily offended somebody. But God puts people in our lives at times when we need it most. Pray about those things. Pray that God will put somebody in your life. If if you feel like you need a mentor, ask God to take you here. This is the best mentor you could possibly have. So I hope that looking at this account of Gideon, when you see these things that happen, when you see these men that fell, when you see that the odds were just, they're, they're, it's impossible. We hear that all the time. That's impossible. Well, by man's thinking, it is impossible. But not with God. With God, all things are possible. <laughs>